I want to take a few minutes before we start Yisker, which Yisker is an instruction to remember. I want to talk a little bit about memory. I'll start, though, by asking you a question. How do you say history in Hebrew? How do you say history in Hebrew? What is it? Historia, which is clearly not a Hebrew word. Historia. It's amazing. We don't actually have an authentically Jewish Hebrew word for history. Some people read the Torah as a history book, but we know it's not really a history book. What we have instead in the Torah is the word toldot. And toldot means legacy. It comes up quite a few times in the Torah. Ele toldot Yaakov. This is the legacy of Yaakov, of Jacob. And then tells us the story of his kids, of what they do. Not all of it very good, by the way, in case you haven't seen it yet. Todot is legacy. And in Judaism, we actually, history matters. We know that it does. But what matters more is the legacy of our history, the stories, and what we learn from those stories, from those experiences, from those moments. Yehuda Kurtzer, one of my teachers, spoke about this week in his podcast, Identity Crisis, about the role of ritual in shaping how and what we remember. And those who get to craft our rituals, our rabbis, our leaders, our ancestors, our grandparents, or what we choose to create for ourselves in our own homes and families as a ritual, we have a lot of power because it shapes how we remember. And ultimately, all of that memory, all of that remembering and the corresponding ritual is ultimately about shaping us to feel and act in a certain way. It's not really memory for memory's sake, but rather to get us to be certain people in this world. And the word for memory, which came up over and over again actually today in our tefillah, is the word zikaron, to remember. We said it as Ella Eskera, these we remember, stories of martyrs. Zochenu Lechaim, remember us for life. Zochenu Adelenu Boletva, remember us, God, for good. And in the Torah, the word. Zachor or Zachor comes up connected to everything that is important. <coughs> remember that God created the world. Zachor et Yom HaShabbat de Kocho, remember the day of Shabbat. Zachor, remember that we were slaves in Egypt. Zachor ki gerim heitem, remember that we ourselves. We're strangers, and so we have to remember to treat other people well and not to make other people feel like strangers. Zechor, Tashir Asadech Amalek, remember what the people of Amalek did to us when we were most vulnerable. And also, maybe most importantly right now, 
And it's a bracha that we say whenever we see a rainbow reminding us of God's promise that there will be better times and that God won't destroy the world in the same way. We say, and we call God as Zochel Habrit, the one who remembers the covenant. And with that, I want to share with you three stories that I learned this year and got to meet these people who shared these stories with me about how they remember and how they put this memory into action. This summer, I spent a month in Israel, and when I was there, I had the opportunity to visit the Gaza border cities twice. I want to tell you about some of the people that I met. At the Nova Festival site, which is now one big memorial site, there are placards with the faces and the names and the stories of those who were murdered there. There's a section created by JNF where they have planted a tree in memory of each of those people. Some families have created monuments, larger monuments for their beloved. And when I was there, I was there together with Shirel, who some of you might remember as working here at the synagogue with our youth, who lives very close to those communities, and she too was evacuated with her family on October 7th. It was a really hot day. And in the blazing heat of that day, breaking what was otherwise complete silence, was this one elderly man. His name was Arnon. And I know this because I went up to him with the chutzpah that I have. And I spoke to him for a few minutes and asked him, what are you doing here? And what was different about this guy is while everybody else was moving silently, some people reciting silent prayers, many people crying, our nun sat there on a chair playing on his saxophone. He was playing Israeli melodies. I think there was some Ed Sheeran and Coldplay mixed in. But he was just playing. And so I walked up to him and I said, what are you doing? In a nice way. What are you doing here? And he said... He comes to sit here and play music for a few hours, a few times a week because it's what he can do. That's what he can do. Then he, he was a pretty gruff guy despite his saxophone in hand. He begrudgingly told me his name, Arnon, and then he kept on playing. A week later, when I was in Hostage Square in Tel Aviv, there he was again, playing his saxophone once more. I went up, I said hi to him. He said, oh, you're the one who bothered me. (laughs) On my second visit to the south, I had an opportunity to go into Kfar Aza. One of the communities that was really destroyed. One of the communities with the most death. One of the communities with the greatest number of hostages taken. Our tour guide that day was a man named Asaf. Asaf took us around showed us the horrible destruction. And for a few minutes, we sat outside of his home. 
I want to tell you three things about a Seth. Three actions. The first was that he was really reluctant to leave when he and his wife were saved and were taken out. He didn't want to leave at all. But the army forced him to. And they were, I think, the first ones to return 20 days later, even before they had water and proper electricity in Kfaraza. He was committed to come back. And when I was there in his home in July, he and his wife were two of the 20 who had returned out of the thousand who had lived there before October 7th. And I think he was sort of this character before, but he definitely became this character after October 7th, where he became, and he and his wife became the Abba and Ima, the parents of the kibbutz. And they put on their porch a fridge and a stove, and they filled it with food so that anybody who came into the kibbutz to try to work on their properties, to collect some of their goods, even if they weren't living there, could have somewhere to find some food and somewhere to just sit for a few minutes. And just the Friday night before, Asaf and his wife welcomed people around their table on their porch for Shabbat. It's the kind of guy that Asaf is. And as we were leaving and ending our tour, he showed us his arm. And I can tell you that Asaf, I apologize Asaf if I get this part wrong, but he's a big guy. Probably like six foot three or six foot four, maybe about 250 pounds, like a big presence. But what Asaf does not look like is somebody who would be covered in tattoos. And he's not. There's one tattoo on his body, and it's one that he placed after October 7th, that simply has the numbers 10, 7, 23. And I asked him, again in my chutzpah, why'd you choose to do this? And he had it on his forearm, and he said he made a point of not putting it exactly in the same spot where Holocaust survivors have their tattoos. But he wanted it to be exactly where we say in the Shema, where we place our tefillin, that these words, these memories need to be on our arms and close to our hearts. Felt he needed it to be a physical part of him. Story number three Rachel Goldberg Poland, who I've spoken about a lot over these holidays, and when I had a chance to meet in a small group with her, my time in Israel. But for any of us who have heard her speak this year, any time she would speak about her beloved son, Hirsch Zichronaldi Vracha, she would say, and she would talk about what made Hirsch special. She would remember him for his goodness, and kind, his kindness, his sensitivity, for being a kid who never yelled at his mother. I don't know how that's possible. But that's how she remembered him. For his curiosity, for his love of travel. And one of the ways that he presented his curiosity was that he would study, really study from a young age, National Geographic. And one year, that's what he asked for. As a gift, I want the National Geographic magazine because I want to know all about this beautiful world. I want to explore it one day, which he did and was planning on doing more of it. And, he, and Rachel spoke about all of this when she spoke at the DNC 
the Democratic National Convention together with her husband, John. And among the millions of people who are listening to that speech were the editors and the ones today responsible for the National Geographic magazine. Rachel and her husband, John, after Hirsch's murder, posted on Instagram a letter that they received from National Geographic that came together with the issue from the day that he, or the month that Hirsch was born. They said to him, thank you for sharing his story with us. And here's just a small token to let us know, to let you know that we are remembering him with you. Since his death, although they only posted a few times, Rachel and John spoke about first at his funeral about how much comfort they got about the fact that they knew that when Hirsch was killed, that he was not alone. And this too becomes a part of the story and the way that they are choosing to remember him. That he wasn't alone. That he was with five other beautiful souls at the end. And right before Yom Kippur, they posted a video that they recorded just this week in an interview I'm not going to say much of it because it is really graphic. But they said that when they found Hirsch's body, they found him with Eden resting her head on his chest. And for them, again, this was a source of comfort thinking about their son at the very end, until the very end, being in physical contact, supporting someone else. Aviva just took us through the process of as we recited Aleinu, thinking about what is our responsibility We're remembering these people and we remember this time, this moment in our lives. But it has to be for something. The memory alone without ritual, without action is not enough. So again, I ask us the question of Aleinu, it is on us to remember But for what? What do we want it to do to us? And what do we want to do with it? Just a moment. We're going to rise together and recite the score as we remember all of our loved ones together with all those who were murdered this year and all those in this world who have lost their lives this year. All the innocent We say the words in Avinu Malkenu, Avinu Malkenu Zachenu Bzikaron Tov Milfanecha. We ask God to remember us for good because we want good things to happen, but we also ask God that our memories, that our remembering be for good. And as John said in his eulogy for his son Hirsch, Yehi Zicham Apecha, may all this remembering, may all their memories, be a revolution for good.